Welcome, birders. This is Ed Pullen, your host at the Bird Banter Podcast, where birders talk birding. Memorial Day weekend is in the rearview mirror, and uh, it was a nice weekend. I have good memories of Memorial Day weekend. One of my best birding memories of Memorial Day weekend is going to the Washington Audubon Society Weenus Campout. Uh, the Washington Audubon Society holds a campout at Weenus Campground uh, every year, and I've been to that two or three times. Uh, but my fondest memories are of a year when the kids were young. Uh, Gene and Brett were just maybe seven or eight years old, and Kay and I took them out to camp out at the Weenus Campground for the camp out. And I had big expectations the weekend. They had advertised having uh, youth activities during the mornings where you could have your kids go on a, on a youth activity. And I thought, well, I'll be able to get out and do some birding with one of the trip leaders, and that'd be really cool. Uh, and it was really cool. I got there. Uh, we got there, and turns out that uh, they were recruiting for the youth trip leader, and I ended up being the youth trip leader for the weekend, or for the first day at least, and uh, led the group of young kids around the campground, and we looked at great horned owls branching on nest, branching out of the nest onto branches, and raccoons, and uh, probably muskrat, and a lot of other cool stuff that you could see around the campground, but not quite what I had in mind. I didn't realize I was going to be a youth, youth trip leader. But I was and had a nice day of it. And that night, uh, there were songs around the campfire, and we had a nice night camping out. And the next day, uh, one of the things you could do was sign up to uh, be the monitors for the week on the Bluebird boxes on the Bluebird trailer, or some of the Bluebird boxes. So Kay and I, the kids, went out to Ump Tatum Road where there's a long Bluebird trail, and we would go to each numbered box, and we'd watch the box and see what kind of birds were in it, either mountain bluebird or western bluebird, or sometimes tree swallow, or sometimes uh, chipping sparrow, or not chipping sparrow, blue, uh, other other uh, species. Uh, but it was really uh, very nice. Uh, we'd record whether they were young in it. We had a snake in one of them. That was really scary. Uh, and we had a chipmunk in one of them when we'd open the box to, to do the monitoring. So that was pretty cool. We ended up uh, sponsoring bluebird boxes. I think for $5 a year, or some pretty nominal fee, you could sponsor a bluebird box. And we sponsored one for each of the kids for quite a few years. And we get a nice letter back from the Yakima Audubon Society telling us uh, what, what species of bird had nested in the box and how many young had fledged. And it was just really kind of cool, cool thing to do. We got that as a a Christmas present for the kids each year for a number of years. That was always fun to get the letter and put that under the Christmas tree. So we enjoyed that. Uh, and then that night uh, we got back and the weather rolled in big black clouds and it looked like it was going to be a torrential downpour during the night. And we were definitely fair weather campers. Uh, in those days with the kids, we packed up, threw everything in the car and drove home. <laughs> Slept in a dry bed that night and made it a two-day one night weekend instead of a two night three day weekend, but had a good time with the kids and some made some memories for the family that was really cool this mer this Memorial Day weekend I had a, a nice experience too. A new friend and I went out to anderson island it 's an island uh, in the Puget Sound just off Steelicum has a very short ferry ride to get there, and we just explored it was pretty fun. It's a heavily forested island, more more densely forested than I thought it would be. And most of the trails, oh, there are lots of little parks with trails. Most of the trails are through pretty dense forests where you see the usual forest birds, you know, Bewick's wren, Swainson's thrush, uh, lots of song sparrows, uh, but not really a big variety of birds. Uh, pretty much the same birds you'd find in almost any fairly dense uh, uh mostly dug for a forest around here. But they do have something different. They have trails that go down to the beach. And on the beaches, there's just a, usually a small beach with a high sandy bank. And these sandy banks are a cool, kind of a unique habitat. High sandy banks right on salt water. And so they're great nesting places for pigeon guillemot. Pigeon guillemot are the, the common nesting alcid that we have in the Puget Sound area. Alcids are birds that are sort of like the penguins of the northern hemisphere. Uh, anyway, uh, they uh, are birds that generally nest on land and spend most of their lives at sea otherwise, but these are coastal-loving alcids. And pigeon guillemots are cool. They have big white wing patches. They're black birds. Uh, they have bright red legs and a bright red mouth when you see it open. They have this chirpy little call. 
and they dig burrows into the sandy banks where they nest. And so we came across at least two uh, large colonies, 20, 30 birds uh, of pigeon guillemot nesting in these sandy banks. And we'd see the you know, good-sized flocks in the water chirping away. They've got this cool little chirping sound they make. We've got a nesting colony of pigeon guillemot talking here on Anderson Island. And that was fun. I'd seen lots of pigeon guillemots, but not a lot of colonies. So that was fun to see. And of course, along with them were northern rough-winged swallows, one of our two uh, western Washington brown swallows. Uh, northern rough-winged swallows also make uh, nest holes in sandy banks. And so they were in the smaller little holes would be the northern rough-winged swallows, and the big cavity, big cavities would be the pigeon guillemots. So that was fun to see. Uh, and uh, we had a nice day doing that. Uh, this week also we had our ABC meeting. ABC is our birding club uh, here in Pierce County, uh, sort of an offshoot of the, the local Audubon Society. And uh, you can hear about that. Uh, Ken Brown actually is the, the patriarch of that. And he and I had our episode, episode two of the Bird Banner podcast. And I think in episode six, I talk about a trip to Southern California Ken and I took. So you can hear all about Ken there. But Ken was a speaker at this week's, this month's uh, ABC meeting. At the meeting, he talked about what's in a name. He talked about bird names, both common bird names and uh, the taxonomic uh, structure, or the how uh, birds are organized and how their names came to be. He uh, went through that whole, uh, the history of that. Ken's a bit of a history buff and had fun with that. Uh, I'm going to try to make uh, a YouTube uh, video of uh, his slides with the, with the audio uh, synced up to that. Uh, I'm still in the process of figuring that out. And if that happens, I'll let you know when that gets up. But uh, he did talk about a few things. Uh, he talked about uh, the the scientific naming system and how that came to be. He talked about Carl Linnaeus. Carl Linnaeus, who came up with the original binomial naming system, was an interesting fellow. Uh, he, w he was pretty much self-educated. His dad had a garden. He learned about a lot about plants working in his dad's garden with him as a child. He went off to university and was a bored student, wasn't very successful, kind of uh, didn't really cut it at the first uh, university he went to. Went to a second university and wasn't doing so well there either uh, until uh, one of the professors figured out from some side work that he was doing that he really knew more than most of them and made him a lecturer. And then he was off and running. So he became a lecturer instead of a student without a formal degree and uh, went on to uh, write uh, Systema Nature, the, the hallmark uh, uh, book, uh, putting a structure to the names and, and organisms. And that went on to become a much uh, larger work, and he's really uh, known as the father of taxonomic, taxonomic uh, systemics. Uh, so that was pretty cool to hear about. Uh, then he went on to talk about Alexander Wilson. He moved to, moved to North America. Alexander Wilson was born in Scotland, uh, and he was a, a rabble-rouser in Scotland. Uh, he uh, wrote uh, satirical works about a coal, a coal miner's strike and uh, was ended up in jail for that and basically was uh, made himself an exile to America, uh, escaped prison and came to America and uh, really didn't have a job. Uh, so, he, so he became a school teacher and in his spare time became the father of American ornithology. Uh, he wrote uh, a, a major works. Uh, he wrote uh, American Ornithology, or The Natural History of the Birds of the United States, a nine-part series. I think seven were published while he was alive. He died pretty young. The other two were published by one of his uh, benefactors, uh, but uh, really set the, set the mark for American Ornithology, put down the Sentinel work. And when they went on to Ken then talked about John James Audubon. He called him J.J. Uh, John James Audubon, uh, a, a 
colorful person in American birding history. Uh, a lot of people think of him as the father of American ornithology. He really was a good ornithologist, but he was a really good artist. His claim to fame was uh, painting birds in their natural uh, setting, uh, in a natural looking pose, in a natural looking setting. Uh, and he struggled with a lot of things. Uh, he uh, w was bankrupt at least once. He probably was a grave robber. He uh, it was, a, I think he was just a tough uh, person uh, to be around at times. Uh, definitely a shotgun ornithologist, uh, killed a lot of birds. Uh, but that's the way it was in those days before good optics. And uh, he was a draft dodger. <laughs> yeah. He uh, was in Europe and came back to America to stay out of the war. Uh, so a lot of uh, things that some people would call strikes against him. But anyway, uh, he gave a colorful story of Audubon and his history. Audubon went on to name a lot of birds after people. Uh, some, some people were famous for naming birds after places or other things, but uh, he gave birds a lot of people's names. Uh, so you've heard of Grace's Warbler and Lucy's Warbler and things like that. He named birds after people. Uh, next, the next person Ken talked about was Elliot Coos. Elliot Coos was the founder of the American Ornithological Society. He was a Western ornithologist. He was a uh, military officer who worked, I believe, in, in uh, Arizona or New Mexico and, uh, and was an uh, outspoken guy. Ken really likes this guy. He was a very, very uh, outspoken, tough to get along with fellow, it sounds like. He was described as a vicious opponent in scientific debates uh, and was pretty outspoken. Uh, and complained about everything. He was a, uh, of all things, he supported women's rights. Oh my goodness, he supported, Na supported Native American rights. Definitely unpopular uh, positions in his day. And uh, uh, just a colorful sort of fellow uh, who uh, did a lot of, a lot of cool ornithologic stuff. He was a top uh, ornithologist, started the AOU, and uh, was another person Ken talked about. So we had a really fun evening. The Willettes were there, of course. The Willettes are a group of women in our birding club, uh, and they have several claims to fame. They travel a lot. They are a pretty good-sized group of women. They travel a lot. They go to the ABA Festival a lot, uh, the ABA Conference a lot. Uh, they go to birding festivals. They travel internationally. Uh, but they, mo the biggest claim to fame is one on our birding trips, they bring wine. Uh, of course, the wine has to have a bird on the label. Uh, some people like their reds, and some people like their whites, and some people like heavy wines, and some people like uh, wines with a big body. Well, the lots like wine with a bird on the label. Uh, so they have a different uh, criterion than some uh, some wine lovers. Uh, and I've uh, I've uh, uh, lured them to my uh, condominium in a couple of weeks. We're going to record a episode for the Bird Beater podcast, and of course I used wine as my uh, wine as my attractant. So they're going to come and have a glass of wine with me. We're going to record an episode in a couple of weeks, so stay tuned for that. They also wear matching t-shirts, so I'll, I'll try to get a picture uh, for the thumbnail for the episode of uh, a bunch of Willats with matching t-shirts. They wore their WAS convention, recent WAS convention, a regalia to the, to the most recent ABC meeting. They always come uh, in uniform uh, with matching t-shirts. Uh, so that's the well, that's story. Uh, so I've also been following Blair Burnson. Blair is a friend from Washington, and he is doing an epic sort of adventure. Some people do a big year. Some people do a big state year, big ABA year, big world year. There are lots of big years. Well, Bruce, uh, Bruce Blair is doing a, uh, a different type of big birding adventure. He's trying to go to every state in the U.S., 50 states, and in one day in each of those states see 50 birds. Uh, and he's trying to do that, I believe, with an interesting person from that area. So he's doing that. I think he's, he's, he's definitely writing a blog about that. You know, BlairBirding.com. You can check it out. It's pretty good. He's got a Facebook page that's pretty good, too. Uh, and I'm hoping to get Blair on a future episode. I think that's going to happen. He's just been traveling a lot and haven't been able to arrange that. But I'm hoping to uh, get Blair on to talk about his adventures also. Uh, but I think you ought to check out Blair, Blair, uh, Blairsbirding.com and, and you can follow his adventure. I think he's finished 38 states now. And he's supposed to be home in a couple of days. So uh, check out Blair Birding and that'll be fun too. But anyway, until next time, good birding, good day.